Thank you very much, Curtis, and welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us tonight for what I know is going to be a lively conversation with somebody who really knows the federal courts and the media. And those two things don't always go together, or maybe they never go together. <laughs> um, before we begin, though, I want to introduce, uh, well, of course, everybody here is a distinguished guest, but I particularly want to introduce two federal judges, uh, my old friend, my longtime friend, Glenn Davidson. Glenn, we're glad you're here. Welcome. And Judge Sharon Acock, the Chief Judge of the Northern District. The judges, welcome. Glad you're here. And then I never want to pass up an opportunity to recognize and present and say thank you to everybody's favorite Chancellor, Robert Kayak. And David Cruz, who knows federal courts backwards and forwards, is here as he is for every program. He's on the board of the Overby Center and makes many, many contributions in many different ways. We're fortunate tonight to have with us Jim Duff. I will admit going in on the front end that I'm biased because <laughs> Jim is a good friend of mine. Uh, notwithstanding that, he is outstanding in almost every way I know. He is chief of the administrative offices for the federal courts, which means he's responsible for all the federal courts. Now, as Judge Davidson and Judge Acock know, he doesn't tell the judges what to do, <laughs> but he provides the administrative support for all of the judges and all 30,000 employees of the federal courts. And so he knows the court backwards and forwards. In addition to that, he's worked for three different Chief Justices of the United States, and um, he was uh, a top counsel and assistant for Chief Justice Rehnquist, and we'll get into some of that. When I retired uh, about seven years ago or so, uh, we looked all over the country, literally, for, uh, as I said back then, somebody smart to take <laughs> my place. They needed that, and uh, after a national search, they settled on Jim Duff to take my place as the CEO of the Museum and the Freedom Forum. And that made him an instant expert on the media, <laughs> and he presided over many programs around the country involving the media. So Jim is not only an expert on uh, the judiciary, but he's also an expert on the media. And we're gonna have an opportunity to talk to him about that. First, he and I together, and then uh, we look forward to your joining the conversation as well. So Jim, let's start out this way. We know that tomorrow night, President Trump is going to deliver his State of the Union message. And every president attempts to answer the question, what is the State of the Union? So uh, prior to that, uh, I will ask you, what is the state of the federal judiciary? Well, thank you, Charles. And uh, let me first thank you personally for inviting me here. I love being back to Ole Miss and visited often when I was at the museum and even before then. And so uh, such a great honor to be here with our judges and Robert Kayat, who's a dear friend, David, and Melinda Tucker, who I worked with at Baker Donaldson for many years. Uh, I just feel like I'm coming home. So I'm grateful uh, for the invite to, uh, to be back here on the campus. Your beautiful, I've, beautiful campus. I've got to interrupt him. He didn't always come back here in such a friendly state. <laughs> he uh, played for Adolf Rupp's Kentucky basketball uh, <laughs> team. And uh, his back then they played as freshman uh, team separate from the varsity. And his team at Kentucky, uh, which he played on, was number one in the country and undefeated. And Ole Miss was a victim to his <laughs> prowess. So, notwithstanding that, well, again, I love coming to Ole Miss for a lot, a lot of and reasons. And we could start out on what is the state of basketball at uh, Kentucky, but we won't do that. We'll just just give us the state of well, uh, the, the federal, federal judiciary. The Chief Justice does a year-end report every year. Uh, it publishes it on New Year's Day, and it. Uh, he focuses on a, a, a topic usually each year. Uh, in years past, I think Chief Justice Berger used to give a state of the judiciary address every year, and he would address, uh, he would do it at an ABA annual meeting. Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, continued the tradition of doing a, 
annual address on the, um, in a year-end report on the state of the judiciary, and Chief Justice Roberts does now too, except he focuses on uh, mostly on a, um, an issue of interest rather than the broad landscape. But speaking broadly about uh, the, the federal judiciary, uh, we're doing uh, very well. We have our challenges, certainly. Uh, I think we, uh, Judge Acock sits with me on the budget committee of uh, the federal judiciary. And thanks to her good work and the work of all other federal judges who work on that committee, we have uh, done well with our appropriations from Congress. When they pass a budget bill, uh, we, we've fared well, certainly by comparison to others in the federal government. Uh, and it's because we're, I think, very good stewards of the public funds. We uh, uh, are careful with the spending. Uh, we, in our budget process, will actually uh, inform Congress if we've overestimated uh, our budget needs and we'll give money back to Congress. Nobody in government does that but the federal judiciary. And as a result, I think we've gained great credibility with our appropriators. Uh, we've had other challenges legislatively of late, certainly, uh, with the uh, government shutdown. We've managed to work through that with the federal judiciary, within the federal judiciary, by using incoming fees from our court filings and uh, carryover money that's not obligated to anything specific so that we actually met our payroll for all 30,000 employees and our federal judges throughout the shutdown. So that was unique, uh, I think, within the federal government as to those uh, parts of the government that were affected by the shutdown. Now, if we have another one, uh, I don't think we're going to fare quite so well. So there will be great challenges in, in that regard. Our border courts are uh, overworked. Uh, our judges there carrying uh, huge caseloads. And that number is going up with increased law enforcement at the borders. Uh, so we have certain needs within the branch. The vacancies are being filled uh, now. Uh, at a, a, a good pace. We had hoped for, and regardless of administration, we pushed for that, uh, whether it's a, a Democrat or Republican sitting in the White House. We need our vacancies filled. And uh, so we're, we're, fair, we're doing better, I think, in, in getting uh, vacancies filled. And, uh, so overall, I, I think the, uh, if you look at, I'm not big on reading polls to make judgments on many things, but among the three branches of government, the federal judiciary ranks highest in public trust, and uh, I think there's good reason for that, uh, and our judges are, the independence of our federal judges um, is extremely important uh, as a contributor to those poll numbers. Speaking of the State of the Union, uh, you remember a few years back, it became a little bit controversial about whether Supreme Court justices should attend yes. uh, the State of the Union because there's a lot of stand-up applause and the justices stand there pretty dour and not clapping. Well, help us understand that issue and if you have a view about whether justices should attend State of the Union. Well, it's it's... The State of the Union has evolved over the years. Uh, historically, it, it wasn't used so much as, uh, as a political platform to espouse your political viewpoints, but rather the State of the Union. And I think President Eisenhower, if I'm not wrong about this, but uh, you all can look it up, but I think his state of the, one of his State of the Union messages was eight minutes long. Um, other presidents have similarly uh, spoken briefly about the State of the Union. But in recent decades, I would say, I don't know where it started exactly, but presidents have used it more and more to uh, promote their agenda and political viewpoints on issues. And it puts the Supreme Court in a bit of an awkward position to sit there. I, when I was counselor to Chief Justice Rehnquist, I accompanied the uh, justices to the State of the Union and was sitting in the front row and 
while everyone in the whole audience, you know, they're, they're saying things that everyone would applaud about, and then they would say things that only half the room would applaud about. But we would sit there and you know, not applaud about anything because we didn't, the judges and justices didn't want to appear to be expressing any opinion on something that might ultimately come before the court. So you would sit there like a bump on a log while everybody else around you is applauding apple pie or something and the, you feel a little awkward. So I, I think over the years, the argument for the justices attending, uh, which is espoused by many still on the court, is that it's a symbolic uh, gesture and it's good for the country. It shows all three branches of government together in one place at one time. And it's the only time that happens, really, uh, except perhaps at uh, inaugurations. But, um, but here is in the, uh, the House chamber. They're all, all three branches are there. Uh, and so there's, a, it's, there's an important symbolism to that, I think, that's holding it together. But there are justices, I think, who feel like uh, it's no longer um, what it used to be, and um, why go through it? So you have, uh, I think, varying degrees of attendance now uh, among the justices. But the court is represented, so I think that's most important. However many justices they get uh, to go these days is probably not as important as it used to be, but it is still important, I think, as a demonstration of unity within the, uh, our government. That's all three branches of government together. So, so you mentioned Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, amazingly to me, you voted for all the Chief Justices. I mean, you uh, worked for all the Chief Justices in our lifetime. Uh, yes, sir. Chief Justice uh, Warren Burger, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and now Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, how how would and that's three Chief Justices in that time. We've had like seven or eight presidents. Uh, how would you compare those three, and what insight could you give us about each one of those that uh, that we might not understand otherwise? Well, they, um, you're right. I think we've had uh, 17 chief justices in our history, uh, so it's an appointment for 44 life. presidents. Yes, so it's an appointment for life, and they have uh, enormous, uh, lasting uh, historical impact. I think. Uh, probably more in some ways than the other two branches of government uh, would have. Chief Justice Berger was, uh, he was a mastermind at, at court administration and he instituted many uh, programs that brought the courts up uh, to speed, both uh, in the way we handle cases and organizations that support the court's work uh, the administrative office of the courts, where I'm now director, um, w uh, flourished under the Burger years. He was very focused on court administration uh, and, and devoted a lot of energy to that. And that was at a time when the Supreme Court was hearing about 160 cases a year in oral argument at the at the court, and that's very different than today's schedule of cases. They're now hearing about 80, about half that number of cases. They're getting even more petitions to, for, for, for certiorari to hear cases at the Supreme Court than they used to. That number keeps climbing. But the number of cases they actually hear has declined over the years. And there are various theories as to why that's the case. But Chief Justice Berger, at a time when they were hear, uh, hearing arguments in more cases, than twice as many cases as they do today, was uh, devoted to court administration too. So he worked uh, around the clock. I mean, he, it was a seven day uh, a week job for him. And uh, that's where he left his mark, I think, uh, a, a big mark in his tenure, was in uh, organizations supporting the court, creation of the uh, National Center for State Courts, the ends of court, uh, and, and uh, so he left a big mark there. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, was, I think, and by his own admission, was uh, enjoyed uh, focusing more on the 
court opinions and writing less so on the court administration, although he streamlined court administration for us and uh, made the judicial conferences and its committees uh, more uh, efficient and uh, pushed decisions out of the judicial conference and down into its committees and all the hard work. Uh, so our judicial conferences that meet twice a year uh, were more efficient. In the Burger years, they used to meet for two or three days every session. In the Rehnquist years, you, we got the, all that work done in half a day. So, so let me more. interrupt you. I know that Judge Rehnquist, Justice Rehnquist, was very efficient in his time, yeah. and he even wrote several books he while did. he was Chief Justice. How did he manage to get all that done? Well, he, he was a remarkable man. He was a brilliant man. Uh, he did write three books while he was Chief Justice. I, how he did, and he wrote them. I mean, he he it wasn't ghost written by anybody. He wrote them. Uh, he he was a uh, very interested in history, uh, very well read. Uh, his books are uh, extremely well written and very informative, and they're about historical events. He actually wrote. I wish I knew what stocks he had because he wrote a book uh, on impeachment trials. Uh, about it was published about six months before the presidential impeachment trial that he presided over. He wrote a book uh, about uh, civil liberties during wartime, uh, and, and that predated 9/11, uh, which gave spawned a, uh, a a number of cases and issues that pitted our civil liberties against. Homeland Security, and he wrote a book about this, uh, focusing mainly on the Lincoln years, President Lincoln during the Civil War, balancing civil liberties versus national security issues. Uh, and, he, 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 and he wrote another book uh, about the closest election in American history, and it was the Hayes-Tilden election. And then a few months later, it was Bush Gore. So I don't know how he managed to do that, but he, all of his books were uh, turned out to be of an historical review, but they were topical and current events. That's amazing. Well, let's kind of stop here for a minute. You mentioned uh, uh, his presiding over the impeachment trial in the Senate yes. of President Clinton. And because you were his counsel, you were one of only two or three people that weren't in this, that weren't actually senators yes. who got to sit on the floor there yes. and watch the debate take place even in private. Tell us a little bit about what you learned from that process and maybe even tell us what uh, Justice Rehnquist did in his spare time uh, when, <laughs> when the Senate wasn't in session. Well, he, he was reading briefs usually. He, we didn't, he didn't miss a beat with his work over at the Supreme Court, but we uh, and it actually was timed uh, coincidentally and, and fortunately during about this time of year when the Supreme Court has a February break uh, so he could attend uh, without interrupting his presiding over the cases at the Supreme Court at the time. But uh, I, I, we're 20 years out since that impeachment trial and, and I think there was, uh, there was some uh, provision that you wouldn't speak about it for 20 years, so I think I'm free to right. answer the questions more Amen. now. <laughs> but uh, I, what I will, uh, so I want to be careful about uh, what I say, but what I wished for, which would never happen, and you'll see why in a second, is that the American people could have heard the deliberations that were in private because it, when they, the, the cameras went off and the lights were turned down to a normal level as opposed to providing for television coverage, and the deliberations in the Senate body uh, about the impeachment trial, if you closed your eyes, you wouldn't know if it was Republican or Democrat speaking. It was very candid exchange of uh, viewpoints, concern, issues, sympathy, things that you didn't hear 
when the lights were on and the cameras were on and the and, and they were boom they would go to their corners and republicans this side democrats that side and never the twain shall meet publicly but privately in the deliberations it was far more uh considered i would say and uh, uh it was too bad but it also speaks to the the, the political environment we're in these days, very polarized. And uh, I think the American people are hungry for uh, uh, people who work together across the aisle. Work. You know, our judges who are here, they do this every day. And, and, and appellate judges, especially district judges, make hard decisions every day. You have to make a decision in a, in a, to, to resolve conflicts. You have to come down on one side or the other, and sometimes both sides have good points, and you try to find the common ground and blend and make a decision. And uh, our courts do that every day. Our other two branches of government have fallen out of the practice of compromise, working through difficult issues. Anybody who's practiced law or anybody who's been involved in conflict resolution will tell you the hardest thing to do is come up with a solution when, especially when two sides, both sides have valid points that they're making. Well, where do you, how do you get it to work? I mean, our whole country was founded on, on these principles. How do you blend national interests with state interests? And we've got this constitutional structure that provides, through compromise, methods and mechanisms for doing that. Judges do this every day in their uh, decision-making process. And our branch, the judicial branch, I think, uh, works as a result. And I think it, the public recognizes it. You may not like the decision, but you got a decision. And that's a heck of a lot better than uh, shutting the government down because they can't uh, figure out you know, how they're going to work it out, work out their differences. You just quit. You walk away from it. You no, know, that's not government. And, and it, it, uh, so I think our branch is, it, it, it continues to do what I think the founders envisioned all the branches doing working through uh, your, your, the differences to reach um, a decision, a resolution. It won't make everybody happy. And if you've made everybody mad, you've probably come to the right decision, you know, because nobody's gotten everything that they wanted. Well, Jim, maybe uh, two big factors account for this productivity is what I call it. Uh, one is that the judges don't have to seek re-election or election. Right, right. And two is, uh, uh, that judges are supposed to be independent right. and not one party or the other. Right. So could uh, we build this as the importance of independent judges? Could you talk about whether you think that independence contributes to the ability to make this? Oh, I think it's an enormous uh, uh, contributor to the ability to come up with resolution and make decisions. And you don't, uh, they're, they're not beholden to interests to get reelected. And so in some way, that's a very good question because in some ways our branch uh, uh, benefits greatly from that. They don't have to run for election. And it allows them an independence to uh, uh, come up with a, a decision without fear of losing the office. Um, so that's it's a very important element of it. I think one of the... Uh, uh, biggest differences I've seen in the other two branches of government as far as resolving conflicts or reaching compromise or, I mean, Melinda Tucker and I both worked for Howard Baker and, uh, for many years, and he was fond of saying, you know, pay very close attention, careful attention to the people who disagree with you because they might be right. And he, I think he exercised that uh, practice and it enabled him to reach decisions and make compromises when, he, uh, when it benefited the country as a whole as opposed to maybe one viewpoint politically or not. 
But I think the biggest difference I've seen, and I've been in Washington now 44 years since graduating from Kentucky, and uh, I'd say the biggest difference is uh, the business of politics and media for that matter. Uh, there is a profit motive in conflict. I mean, there's an old story about uh, a, ju a, 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 law a guy graduated from law school and he went back to his hometown. He hung out a shingle. He was the only lawyer in town. And everybody told him, you're going to go broke. You, you know, there's nothing, there's no business here. He was the only lawyer in town. And he was going broke. And then another lawyer moved to town. And they both made a fortune. <laughs> and <laughs> the business of conflict, it, there's not as much incentive to resolve it as there is to perpetuate it in, from a monetary standpoint. And it has infected our uh, politics and the media to, to some degree, if we want to veer off into that avenue. But you've got. Uh, political part, fundraising is such an important part of politics these days. Um, and if your uh, conflict has been resolved, you're not getting money from the groups and the people who are interested in protecting their interests. So they're only inter if, they, if you resolve their conflict, they're not going to pay dues to an organization any, any longer. The, you know, you've resolved their conflict. But if, if, there, if that conflict is alive and well and you're worried and th this might happen, if you don't contribute, then you're going to fund it. And I think that is really driving political parties more than the desire to resolve the conflict. Same with media reporting. MSNBC needs Fox News. Fox News needs MSNBC. If they, do you ever think they're going to agree on anything <laughs> and the way to report it? Same story. You get the same story. You turn into either one of those, and you're going to get a completely different uh, angle or viewpoint on the story. We'll get back to the media in a minute, but I interrupted you as you were giving your uh, views of the three Supreme Court justices. Um, is it too early to say how Chief Justice Roberts is going to uh, be remembered for his legacy. Uh, what do you think his main contribution has been so far? Well, he's my boss, and he's a great man. So, <laughs> oh, I love working for, with him and for him. Uh, it's too early to to, to judge, and and uh, I hope he has a long, long, long career. But he has uh, all the right uh, instincts for it and abilities and. Uh, Working with his colleagues, uh, he does a, a very good job of, uh, and it's a collegial uh, court. They, uh, of course, they don't agree on everything, but they get along. And uh, he's a very, uh, he's a very good leader, great leader of the branch. Uh, we've, he, last year, one of the focuses of our his year-end report for two years in a row has been workplace conduct and addressing issues of harassment in the workplace. He's very uh, on top of uh, issues that affect uh, not only the courts, but uh, you know, our society. And uh, he, he's, uh, he clerked for Chief Justice Rehnquist. He was then Justice Rehnquist when Chief Justice Roberts had clerked for him. And so he, he has a lot of, he's inherited systems from Chief Justice Berger and Chief Justice Rehnquist and he's fine-tuned them, and I think he's running the uh, Judicial Conference and his committees even more efficiently than his predecessors. So he'll leave a big mark on, on uh, thank you for coming back to him, because he would ask me, why didn't you talk about me when, <laughs> on the three? But, but he, he'll he leave a big mark, I think, historically. Let's do a lightning round uh, on your impressions of people I mentioned. Uh, Justice Scalia. Uh, you want one word answers or, uh, or just, a, well, he, he was brilliant. He was uh, uh, fun to be around. Ask Justice Ginsburg. She loved him. Uh, and, 
you know, you, you think, of, think of that. I mean, Justice Ginsburg and, and Justice Scalia, and they're very close friends, and that's the way Washington should work. Uh, you know, he, he was uh, uh, outspoken, certainly, or, you know, he wrote in a very uh, dynamic way, uh, but uh, his colleagues, uh, he got along. With Justice Ginsburg. Uh, she is, I, I really admire her greatly, and a strong uh, woman who's uh, dedicated her life uh, to justice. And uh, when my mother passed away, she wrote me one of the sweetest uh, notes I've ever received. She's just very thoughtful, uh, wonderful uh, woman. Justice Sotomayor. She's uh, really made great contributions already, and she uh, was a great judge uh, in the Second Circuit. And uh, she's uh, I, I, very thoughtful. If you've ever heard her speak, she wouldn't be sitting down here. She'd be walking around with a mic, and she'd be talking with you individually. And uh, she's very dynamic. Tell us something about uh, one or more of these Supreme Court justices that we don't know that you see on the inside. Mm. Go ahead, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Something I know about. Uh, well, I think it, it would come as a surprise to many that they get along that, with, with each other, that they forge friendships, much as you all do, every, like everybody does. It does. I mean, it didn't used to matter what your politics were, who your friends were. I'm afraid we're heading in the wrong direction that, these days. You shouldn't let that uh, affect your friendships. Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, a, a very different from public persona. He's, uh, uh, he's another uh, dynamo. He's, he's outgoing uh, privately, and he's, uh, I mean, the public uh, image of him, because he doesn't ask uh, questions on the bench usually, and. Uh, uh, but there have been justices like that in the past in history. William O. Douglas rarely asked questions. And, uh, You're talking but, about driving around in Winnebago? Yeah, well, yeah, he goes on vacations every summer and, and tours the country, and Justice Thomas, that is. And, uh, Justice it, Kavanaugh. Well, he, uh, he's a friend, and I, uh, I, I don't want to veer into current events, uh, much on that, but he's been a, a, uh, a great judge and a uh, great background for the court. He's never met a justice he didn't like. Yeah, uh, that's so true. I we've, asked, been, we've been blessed as a country that way. I mean, we, we've had very good justices. I asked you at the front end of this program to give the state of the federal judiciary. What is the state in your mind? What is the state of the media? Well, I'll go back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about polarization. Uh, I think we're in a cycle. I think media cycles historically have gone from being really biased uh, to more uh, neutral. And early in our history, uh, the media outlets were owned by the politicians. And I think we're down, you know, and then they kind of climbed out of that for a while. And I, I don't know how many of these cycles we've had, but we're, I think we're back in a cycle where the media is, is being, is, is too opinionated in its reporting uh, rather than providing a neutral account and letting you uh, and the, the public generally uh, uh, make up your own minds. Uh, about what uh, you know, your, your your viewpoints, political uh, viewpoints about a story. I'll give you an example. I was uh, uh, this weekend. I was visiting with a friend of mine in, in uh, Gainesville. He's eight, and he's in his eighties. I was there for the Kentucky Florida basketball game. Kentucky won, by the way. Uh, and uh, we were having breakfast, and he took out the morning paper. And he said, I've made a practice of circling adjectives in the news reports on the front page. 
And I said, really? I said, yeah, it's, it's just so biased these days. You can tell, you know, it's not news, it's all editorials it's all that appear. So I said, well, show me, give me an example. He read the first paragraph of a, of a story on the front, and he circled three adjectives within the first paragraph that uh, completely slanted uh, the report uh, and turned it into a, a very negative one in, in which it, if you'd left the adjectives out, it would have been a news story uh, and you would have had questions, but obviously the author wanted you to feel a certain way about these facts. So I, I think we're uh, in a cycle of polarization in, in the uh, media and a part of that's business driven, frankly. And I, I think uh, just much like our politics, I think the American public is sort of hungry for neutral news reporting. Boy, you know, we don't, aren't you worn out by listening to uh, biased viewpoints one way or the other and, and what I am, but you know, I'm old, so. <laughs> if we wanted to be as informed as possible about what the Supreme Court is doing, which media should we turn to? Well, I, I think it's very simple. I think you read their opinions. I don't think you, uh, you, you uh, look to media. Uh, and you can read their opinions uh, of any court, any judge, any uh, justice. Uh, it's not hard. You can go online, read it for yourself, and, and uh, make up your own mind. What, uh, if, they, if you agree with them or not. Don't let somebody color your viewpoint about what a judge or justice has written. Why well, delight when I read uh, an opinion by a justice who I thought would be this way on the case but comes out that way on it. It's wonderful, and then you see the logic. My problem was in law school, I would read uh, one opinion and I'd say, well, that's absolutely right. And then I'd read the dissent and I said, well, that's absolutely right. So I couldn't figure it out. Mm. But I think it's better if you go to the source yourselves. And I think one of the great benefits of uh, new media and the internet and our resource capabilities is that you can get to the original source yourself very easily and not be as dependent on uh, media as we've perhaps been in the past to get our news. Now, if you want opinion, then you can tune in or read you know, any variety of things. I want our audience to join this conversation. I'm going to ask Jim one more question, and then we we'll go to the audience. Uh, Jim, uh, when we we'll talk about the museum, uh, have any of you been to the museum before? Good. You better go er quickly if you want to go again. Um, uh, there was news this past week that the museum plans to close. They're selling the building there on Pennsylvania Avenue. I was the first CEO of the museum. Jim was the second. I want to get your reaction to the news that the museum is closing. Well, I, like you, uh, I was sad to see that it's, it's going to close its doors on Pennsylvania Avenue, but I'm hopeful that they will relocate elsewhere. It's an an amazing experience. Uh, if you've been there, millions of people have in the last 10 years, thanks to Charles's vision. Um, it, it served an incredible uh, uh, function uh, in educating the public. Um, and I'm very, I hope very much that they will uh, find another location and open, reopen their doors, probably in a reduced uh, fashion. But they put on great programs and, and have wonderful exhibits that are very educational. And uh, you know, they, it, it's, I didn't mean to be so negative about media when I tell you to go to the source. Uh, I just think that original source material these days is much more accessible than it used to be. But uh, the, the, the exhibits and the reporting that was um, exhibited at the museum drew on and draw, draws upon uh, various resources from media that is extremely helpful, uh, putting in historical perspective what the country has gone through and how, how our freedoms have been challenged and how we've, re we've reacted, utilizing the five freedoms of the First Amendment. 
Uh, it's, it's very important, I think, to the country and educating us about, I, I think I, you know, I'm worried about uh, the, the deterioration and the freedoms that we have under the First Amendment. I'm worried that people, uh, this is a generational worry, and of course I'll sound the old in saying this, but I, I feel there's a generational gap in protecting privacy. I think my children don't have the same concepts of protecting their privacy as I did, or I do now. And everything's out there on Facebook or whatever, and, and uh, it's open to the world. Uh, there are downsides to that. There are, very, there are risks in that. I think you have to be careful about what you put out there about yourself, because 20 years later, 10 years later, it can come back to haunt you. Uh, so you have to be a little more careful about it. But anyway, uh, the, the function of uh, the museum is a very, very important one, and the Freedom Forum, I'm hoping, will uh, continue as it has in years past to educate the public about the importance of our freedoms, constitutional freedoms. You talked about original source. We took one original source, the First Amendment, and put it on the front of the building of the museum, 50 feet high, uh, 50 tons and the, put the First Amendment up there where everybody could read it. I guess my biggest disappointment in the museum build, building being sold is they're gonna take that sign down. And I always said, if we didn't have anything inside the building and only had that First Amendment sign there, it would be worth it. So we'll see. Maybe we, uh, Will Norton, maybe we can get that 50-ton uh, uh, <coughs> sign down here and put yeah. it in front of uh, the center. Yep. The Raise the ceiling here a little bit. Go find here. Okay, now let's turn to the audience and give you an opportunity to have a conversation with Jim Duck. Who'll go first? And let's don't be shy. The first one. Yes, sir. Well, I suppose it's you know, case by case kind of uh, judgment call on that. Uh, uh, it, it's, I mean, there is a freedom of expression that you you know that I think is important in the country and where you draw the line and what. But but and then there's threatening and offensive conduct, so it's it's sort of a, a case by case issue. It seems to me. I do think that. Uh, I hear the term radicalization being thrown out there a lot these days. And Charles and I, I'm a little younger than Charles, not much, but we were very, uh, we, your age or a little older during the Vietnam era, and there was a lot of protests, and, and you know, those who protested the war were called radicals, and that speech was, uh, very important, I think, to bringing to conclusion a war that most now everyone would agree was uh, was flawed. Uh, so I, I think we we need uh, freedom of expression, certainly, uh, but you have to be careful because uh, we, you know there are, there are you can cross the line and it. it uh, I think we could do a better job uh, as parents uh, teaching our young people and being examples to our young people as to what's appropriate and what's not. As Jim knows, there was a movement uh, a decade or so ago to establish speech codes on campuses across the country, and the courts ruled those unconstitutional because of the First Amendment. So, so the courts, as Jim said, the, the judges have to come to a decision. First Amendment is, uh, pardon me, Al Gore, the First Amendment is an inconvenient truth. Uh, another question. 
Yes. Yes, Dr. Weems. I assume there are a lot of district judge decisions over in the country right now. And also, I, I, don't, I don't know the details, uh, but I, I, my question the tradition has been that the center presented to pick the state have a role to play, or have a role to play in who gets, uh, who gets nominated for those positions. I've also heard that the Republican Senate may be The question it has to do with uh, nominations to the district courts and the role the senators play in it and it, whether or not the, uh, there's been a change or is a change of foot in t as to how, what role the senators will play. And I think the, uh, the shorthand answer from what I'm hearing or observing is that for district court judges, it'll continue to operate uh, with senators inputs from each state because a district court is located in one state. Uh, you know, there are a number of district courts in any given state. Some states only have one, but uh, many of the larger states have multiple district courts. But the district court nominations, uh, the senators play a, a role in that and the blue slip practice of not uh, opposing or opposing a nominee will continue to be um, observed in the Senate. But for Court of Appeals judges, our, court, our country is divided into 13 geographic circuits, DC having uh, a couple circuits within its, in the District of Columbia, but 11 major geographic uh, circuits. And all of those circuits have overlapping jurisdictions with the number of states. So the, the, the courts of appeals are not just located, uh, there is you know, a central courthouse, but they uh, uh, move over uh, border lines of various, they include borders of various states. And in that instance, uh, the blue slip uh, doesn't uh, make as much sense, I think, for the uh, uh, objections of a Senate, you know, senators from one state holding up a, a nomination for the whole circuit. So that may change. I think that's what you may be hearing. Yeah, about that and also, but I want to refer specifically to the, to the situation with regard to the district courts. Mm -hmm. Or opposing, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Only at the Court of Appeals level, and that, is that what you've heard too, Sharon? Is it just at the Court of Appeals level, not at the District Court level? But I, you know, I'm not. Those aren't my decisions, so I'm. Uh, I'm not certain about it yet. Mr. C. Uh, well, I, I'm not supposed to speak about any pending case. No, no, I just, just. Well, I don't. You know, I don't. The, the, every case the Supreme Court takes is uh, is an important one. Certainly. Uh, there are some that uh, are getting more get more attention than than others, and uh, but uh, you know I, I don't I couldn't enumerate any of the eighty or you know sixty to eighty cases this term that are any more important than than, than the others. They, 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 treat, they treat them all seriously, I would say. So, Clint, uh, because Jim only reads the opinions uh, that come out rather than news media, he avoids saying that the Second Amendment uh, rights will be a major consideration of the uh, Supreme Court. But he doesn't need to get involved in that because he has to deal with all the judges. But because I read the media in general, I'm able to say that. And I better uh, let that go with that. <laughs> Are there any other questions uh, to put Jim on the spot? We've done a pretty good job <laughs> of putting him on the spot. Let's have another question or two. Yes, ma'am, Judge. I would love to address um, some of the 
Well, uh, cybersecurity is a very serious concern uh, within government generally, within society generally. For the courts, it's a very uh, important issue. Uh, there are threats uh, to cyber in cybersecurity every day. We're fending off uh, attempts to break into our systems, and uh, we're uh, trying to stay ahead of uh, those who would invade. Uh, our, our uh, processes. It's very important to the courts to have uh, privacy in its deliberations and before any uh, uh, decisions are made. So it's, it, I think it's a, a serious concern for society as a whole and we're not um, any different in that regard from, from others, but uh, it's something we've certainly focused great attention on within the branch. Who else? Jim, I think these people know that there's food and drink outside <laughs> when we finish. Uh, I want to thank you, Jim, for coming and sharing your insights into the judiciary well, and I'm the media. Delighted to be here. I, uh, well, what, what's most, uh, why don't somebody stand up and tell me where I'm wrong? Where, where, if I said anything that you would take issue with, or am I just, do you sense the polarization here on uh, campus like I'm sensing it in the country or in, in Washington, or are you sort of, uh, it, it doesn't affect you uh, or your, I hope this is the case actually, it doesn't affect you, your friendships or, your, or the way you uh, uh, conduct your uh, lives here in, in, this, in this environment? Is it, uh, uh, I mean, it's hard, I, I'm sure it's sort of hard to form, have a basis of comparison and what are you comparing it to? But I've got, you know, I'm 65 years old, so I can compare it to when I was your age. And it just seems different to me, at least at the um, level of leadership uh, in, in the, in, in, within the government that uh, there, there's, there are fewer people trying to build bridges uh, and, and work uh, toward a, a common end. Uh, do, you see, do you sense it here or is it uh, something that, uh, well, maybe we should just go have a beer. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you'll come back to uh, subsequent programs. Jim, we're grateful that you would take the time. And thank you, Charles. All right, you can tell me over a beer. Thank you.